Time is up. We now move on to questions to the Minister for Agriculture and Rural Development. I call Mrs Joanne Dobson. The order, Mr Stewart. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, uh, Principal Levy Speaker. Um, in, in the discussion which uh, preceded this, um, Mr. McNary uh, was barracking from a sedentary position at the back. The Minister was giving a list of facts, clear figures provided presumably by his department, and they were described from a sedentary position as your lies. Uh, I find that objectionable yeah, and a uh, uh, inappropriate language, particularly when what was being delivered on the floor was clearly a list of facts. Yeah, yeah. Marks have been noted, and I have no doubt that the Speaker will take account of those. Ms. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number one. With your permission, Ken Corley, I will answer questions one and ten together. I can advise that the estimated total cost for the relocation of my departmental headquarters to Ballykelly is 30.8 million capital and 14.3 million resource. These costs are currently being re are refined as part of the full business case process, which is due to be completed by November 2015. I am confident that the wider rural area around the North West will significantly benefit from this project in a number of ways, as well as the construction jobs, local businesses and suppliers in the area will benefit from a much larger customer base. The new headquarters will need to be serviced with functions um, such as cleaning, catering and security services, which will impact on employment in the area. Throughout the design process, my officials have ensured that the building and the site it will occupy can be used for community purposes. This relocation will open up employment and promotion opportunities for the people living in the local area and enhance the potential for staff living in the North West to further their careers in the civil service without having to move to or commute to the Greater Belfast area. Relocation to Ballykelly emphasises that DARD is a, depart a, a department that promotes regional economic rebalancing and that is committed to the sustainability of rural communities. Ms Dobson for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for her answer? I'm just sorry Gregor Campbell isn't in the chamber to hear my answer, but anyway. The costs have been spiralling for this project, not least since her hopes to save £26 million by using the existing buildings on the sites were later dismissed. Can the Minister give a commitment that, in light of the ongoing absence of a business plan, as well as a possible alternative of utilising the empty DVA buildings in Coleraine, that this project represents the best value for public money? Yes, I'm absolutely um, confident in that. Uh, this does represent value for money, and I think the member's information is wrong in terms of um, cost spiralling. The costs have been outlined in the outline business case, and as I said, we're coming to conclusion of the full business case. The benefits um, that this project will bring to the North West and to the, white, to the rural community as a whole will be that it will create um, public sector jobs in that area, the ongoing service in the building, the construction of the building, all those benefits speak for themselves. It's about time that we had all departments looking towards what are the needs of rural communities and um, indeed those people from rural communities that work in the Greater Belfast area now to um, access employment. So the benefits for this project are, are second to none. The benefits for the rural community are second to none. I am committed to making sure that we deliver on um, my headquarters going to Ballykelly. Forest Service has now opened up our office in Fermanagh. We have a Rivers Agency going to Down. Um, and the construction work started last week in the site in Lockery for, River, for Rivers Agency. So I am very committed to decentralisation. I am very committed to making sure there's employment opportunities for rural people as well as those that live in the Greater Belfast area. Before I call Mr Roisin for a supplementary question, as the Minister's Assembly Private Secretary and in line with the protocol, I remind the member that his question should relate specifically to a constituency matter in which he is directly involved. Mr. Roisin. Good morning, Mr. and thank you for your advice there. Uh, indeed, it is about a constituency matter. I welcome very much the rapid uh, work and rate of work on the progress of the DART headquarters in Ballykelly and also the interest expressed in it by uh, others uh, in the site. But could I ask the Minister to outline the details of the transfer of her staff uh, to the Greater Derry area, area in advance of the construction work at Ballykelly being completed? Good um, yes, my officials have analysed the information received from the civil service staff who responded to the expressions of interest that they will be willing to join DARD to work in Ballykelly. And the analysis of, the, of home addresses of these staff has led to the decision to utilise current um, um, vacated accommodation in both Coleraine and in Derry. 
My officials intend to utilise in total somewhere in the region of 100 workstations in Kilrain and Derry in the period between now and when the new site at Ballykelly is ready for occupation in late 2017. My officials, in conjunction with colleagues in DFP, have ensured that the accommodation being considered is flexible to allow DARD to alter the numbers in the advanced accommodation as appropriate. The HR relocation team are also working with business areas on the practicalities of this approach and staff handling plans are being developed um, for those units which will be part of the advanced party. So we're, as we move towards the final project, there is an opportunity, as I say, for all these other staff to go forward and to take up employment in Coleraine and Derry, which I think gives people, obviously, those staff um, even more time to adjust to the, to the new move to Ballykelly. Mr Pat Ramsey. Yeah, thank you. for her response, and she has indicated in a letter response that she would hope to have 100 officials in, uh, relocated to Ballykill in North West by 2017. Could the Minister outline the House how many ultimate staff will be working for DARD in the North West area once the plan is uh, completed? Yes, we have um, 400 staff. We're going to create a, a workstation which would accommodate up to about 600 staff, but we're going to do it on a phased basis to allow the transition. So about 400 staff will be there before the end of 2017, and then an additional 200 on top of that up into 2020. Obviously, with um, changes in department structures and the new department that's being created, there will obviously be some adjustment for new numbers and, and decisions will have to be taken on that. But as we, as we speak today, we're talking 400 in the first phase and then up to 600 in the second phase. Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Principal Deputy Speaker, can the Minister give the Assembly a categorical um, assurance that there will be a continuity of business and that no one will be affected? None of the farmers who uh, we all know is going through a dire situation at the minute, that they will not be affected by this move uh, to Ballykelly. I can give that assurance. Um, we're very mindful of the fact that we're changing how we're going to do business and where we do business from, so that is why we're taking it forward on a phased basis that would allow that transition to happen very smoothly and there'll be no impact on frontline services. Mr. Pat Sheehan. Question number two, please. On behalf of the Department, Rivers Agency undertakes a prioritised programme of flood alleviation schemes across the north to protect people and property from flooding. In terms of significant projects, the Borough Flood Alleviation Scheme was completed this summer and construction of a multi-million pound scheme is ongoing in East Belfast in partnership with Belfast City Council. A considerable number of small-scale improvement works are also being undertaken. Further construction work is planned in South Belfast later this year alongside the ongoing preparatory work to bring a number of schemes to construction stage. I am pleased to advise that 290 homes and businesses benefited from enhanced flood protection in the last financial year as a result of flood alleviation schemes delivered by my department, and a further 156 properties are expected to benefit in this current financial year. Could the Minister tell us what her department is doing to engage with communities who may be at flood risk? Yes, Rivers Agency staff are very proactive in terms of engaging with communities and where it's not possible to undertake a scheme or it will be some time before maybe a scheme can be undertaken, the department takes the lead in working with other responders to improve the community resilience to flooding and this involves helping communities to develop their own emergency response plans. Ms. Claire Hanna. Um, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And the Minister will be aware of the predicament of many householders, uh, particularly in my constituency in South Belfast, who, who live under constant threat uh, of flooding. Can you give an update on the Household Protection Scheme, and can you give some assurance to people uh, that they might still be eligible for that scheme, even if there is an alleviation scheme planned for their area? Because in many cases, that won't begin to take effect for several years, and they'll have the flat threat of flooding uh, hanging over them, and there's a worry that they won't be eligible for the protection grants in the interim? Yes, and I'm happy to discuss that further with the member. I mean, I, I brought forward this scheme for, for the, the reasons that I've said, that sometimes it's not possible to provide a community scheme that benefits everybody. So this is going to help um, individuals protect their own property, with the majority of funding coming from departments, so from Rivers Agency, probably around 90% grant funding. So that's going to be very helpful. We hope to be able to launch this scheme and provide all of those details that you're seeking clarity on in November. So we'll, at that time, we'll be able to provide a lot more detail in terms of um, them. But I want to make sure the scheme is as inclusive as possible and that we actually help people who need the help, particularly those that are waiting for schemes that are possibly two or three or four years down the pipeline. So um, I'll provide the member with uh, more detailed uh, analysis of, of actually who, it's, who it can protect and how to go about actually achieving funding, because I think it'll be important that Rivers Agency actually provide that information so that everybody knows what's there and how they can access it. Mr Andy Allen. 
Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, East Belfast has a large programme of flood risk works being carried out, and I welcome this investment on the Knock, Loop, and Conswater rivers. Can the Minister provide an update on the areas at risk from the tidal surge in January 2014 and how she believes these areas have since been protected from future threats? Said in the original answer, we're working very hard. And East Belfast scheme obviously has been a very significant funding scheme for the department, somewhere in the region of six million. And we're working in conjunction with Belfast City Council, who are in the lead in terms of that project. So work is ongoing. Um, there's been, as I said, significant investment. My department, my rivers agency, are very committed to making sure that we complete and protect all those people who are potentially at risk. As you said yourself, the, the potential that we had with, from the tidal flood, um, flooding was um, very significant and, and very scary, actually, for those people who live in that area. So it's important that we get this scheme completed and that everybody's content just with the protections that are put in place and afforded to all those people. Mr. John Dowlett. Cash Everett 3, question number 3. Uh, I'm going to um, answer questions three, four and five together. I am pleased to have secured 5.1 million for the North as part of the EU aid package. I welcome the fact that the Commission and DEFRA have accepted the strong case that I made for differentiated aid for the North to reflect the unique and extreme circumstances faced by our dairy industry here. As a result, we will receive almost 20% of the Member States' allocation, which includes an additional top-up for the North of Ireland. I have decided to allocate the full funding to dairy farmers only, as the price falls we have seen in that sector are deeper and more prolonged than in any other farming sector. I wanted to ensure that we target those who are facing the greatest losses and cash flow difficulties at this time. Payments will be made uh, based on a flat rate per litre of milk production, so they will vary from farmer to farmer. Legislation known as um, delegated regulation is required at EU level to make these payments. The Commission is finalising this and, and hopes that it will come into effect very soon. My officials are talking to DEFRA officials on an ongoing basis about the detailed practicalities of making the payments and the subordinate legislation which will also be required in this member state. I am anxious that payments are made as quickly as possible and given that our farmers are in the greatest need of support, I have told George Eustace that I want our farmers to receive their payments first. I have pressed him for the aid to be paid as early as possible by the Rural Payments Agency and expect payments will be made in early December. Dalit for a supplement. I thank the Minister for her reply. The Minister has said it's a unique situation. I'm sure she would agree with me. It's a total disaster for many of her farmers. And do they really have to wait to January to get their money? I mean, I agree that it's a really difficult time for the industry, which is why I've fought such a hard case. And we've been successful in, so, in, somewhat in that we've had um, additional funding over and above um, other, particularly when you look towards what Scotland and Wales and the English farmers got. However, I am very keen that this money is paid out as quickly as possible. We're pushing the effort. We need the EU to take, put the, right, the legislation through, and then we can um, move forward. As I said, I have asked DEFRA to prioritise our farmers, given that we are unique and that we are in a, a slightly different situation, a more severe situation. Um, and I, I think that all I can do is keep putting the pressure on. We've been told that um, certainly well, my intention would be that the payments will be with farmers before they have their single farm payment. Mr. Fargal McKinnon. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister and can I ask her what assurance can she give to the non-dairy sector who are experiencing uh, cash flow, flow problems that their problems are being dealt with by her and her department? Um, I've been very active on all of these issues and I think that um, this year in particular we've never seen a scenario where all sectors are struggling at the one time. Um, normally it's, it's maybe a poultry sector or it's the dairy sector and it's individual but this year has been particularly bad for all sectors. For my part there's the practical supports that we can provide through the department through CAFRI. There's the benchmark and there's all, all those practical work we can do but alongside of that I've been meeting with the banks, engaging with them around you know, providing flexibility to farmers. We are um, prioritising making sure that we get the maximum number of farmers paid. So all farmers, all sectors paid their single farm payment in December and working, as I said, practically on the ground. So those, those are the areas where we can work. This is a, a, a really, really difficult year for farming, an absolutely difficult year for farming. And we, we talk to the, and look towards the future where there are opportunities for growth and, and prospects for our industry. We'll have to try and help our sectors get through this difficult time to, so that they're order, unable to, um, to produce in the future. Ms. Bronwyn McGoggin. Minister for her response. Can I ask the Minister, will this payment to dairy farmers impact on the, the, the processing of the new basic payment scheme? No, I can give an assurance that that, that won't happen. Um, the, the way I've decided to pay the, the EU aid out is by using the Rural Payment Agency, um, which is under the remit of DEFRA. That allows us for, um, to get these payments processed separately and it doesn't disrupt um, any of the work that we're doing around um, trying to get everybody paid, the maximum number of farmers paid in December. So 
given in recognition of the difficulties that there are for all sectors, I have made sure that we are um, being able to distribute this funding in a way that won't impact on the basic part payments being made in December. Ms. Sandra Overett. I thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And uh, funnily enough, uh, I, my question has been answered, but I'm thinking of another one here. Um, <laughs> in relation to dairy farmers, whilst it was encouraging that the UK Westminster has recognised Northern Ireland's unique uh, problems through its share, can the Minister now explain how she's going to use this recognition to her advantage uh, now through further discussions with the Commission? We were the only um, devolved area to actually achieve a meeting with the Commission, so we led a delegation that went out and we got, met with the, the Commissioner. We were able to impress on him why we're different and why we're unique, and there was a recognition of that in terms of the, the aid package that we received. So we, we, we've, made our noise, we've made a lot of noise in Europe, and I think that, that there, there's been recognition of that. I've said it from the Commission meeting of the 7th of September, I didn't think the Commission went far enough. Um, I've continued to lobby them. I do think that we still need to see the review of the intervention prices. I've written to Phil Hogan and I've expressed that view. I've also written again to DEFRA. Whilst um, DEFRA listened to the plight of our farmers, I don't believe that they supported the, the need of our local farmers in that they didn't ask for the review of intervention prices. I think that was a failing of DEFRA to recognise the uniqueness of our farmers here in the north of Ireland. So it's a good job that we have a locally elected um, MLAs, that we have got a locally elected executive that actually can go out and fight the corner for our um, local farmers because if we was left to death for you, we wouldn't even be sitting in the position where we are today. Mr Joe Byrne. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I welcome what the Minister has done in relation to lobbying directly in Brussels. But given that the French have managed to provide some extra co opted funding along with their aid package from Brussels, can the Minister give any indication if her department, through DEFRA, can give any extra assistance to farmers who have availed of what is largely a less than wholesome package so far. The members pointed out that the Commission has said that um, member states may provide much funding for the EU targeted aid that's been allocated to member states, and therefore have no intention of putting any additional um, funding to that. Any much funding that um, would be taken forward has to be done on the same basis under which the EU element of the aid is allocated within the member states. So if aid is paid to dairy farmers only across the member state through the EU package, then any match funding you put to that would also just have to go to dairy farmers. However, there's no flexibility within DARD's budget to provide any um, additional match funding. What we need to do is um, make sure that we continue to drive home the message that we need this money paid out as quickly as possible, and that's certainly um, my job of work over the next number of weeks. I've written to DEFRA, as I said. I have asked for our farmers to be prioritised, and I'll continue in that vein until the money is paid out. Mr Jim Mollis. Some of the farming press have indicated that the average payment to dairy farmers will be of the order of £2,000. Can the Minister comment if that is correct? And if so, does she accept that that is but a relative drop in the ocean of losses that are being, uh, 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 taking place? And on the point of her answer to Mr Byrne, uh, the Minister seems to be saying no prospect of match funding. She has two possibilities. She can give match funding. She can also give funding to all the farming community under the de, de minimis rules. Is she saying no to both? In relation to um, how the payments are being calculated, as I said in the original answer, payments will be based on a flat rate per litre of milk production, so they're going to vary from farmer to farmer. I think the, the maybe very crude calculation that some of the papers are running with is basically taking the block money, the number of farmers, and dividing it out. So it looks like an average of 2,000, but that will not be the case. It will be based on their production levels, so, but it will be a flat rate per litre um, paid out in that, in that way. As I said, my priority has been about making sure that we um, get the payments out as quickly as possible. I agree with the member in terms of the aid package that has been put on the table. Whilst we welcome anything that comes in terms of support for the farming industry, because, uh, but I don't believe that this is um, the way to tackle the problem. I think that whilst in recognition there is a cash flow problem, so a bit of cash flow into the system will help, but I do believe that unless they review the intervention price, we will be having this conversation again next year and the year after, and perhaps the year after that, because of the volatility in the markets and just how the markets work. So I think that what we need to do is prioritise getting that money out. I need to continue with the, the, the battle with Europe around asking for that review of intervention prices. I've already committed publicly that's what I'm doing, and I have taken action to that effect. Mr Roy Beggs. Question number six. I fully recognise the commitment and contribution that the Young Farmers Clubs of Ulster make within the rural community through the development of our young people and in providing them with a voice to engage with industry, with government and with their community. 
Indeed, their presence at industry meetings in Brussels in recent weeks speaks volumes for their decision or their dedication to ensure that the views and opinions of our existing and future young farmers are, he are heard. I was delighted that the UFU um, or the young farmers exhibited within the Dar Pavilion at the National Ploughing Championships in Port Leash a few weeks ago. And this gave them an ex excellent opportunity to network with their counterparts, the Macro and the Firma, and to build on that important youth relationship. I was also able to have meaningful discussions with them about their recent achievements and plans for the future of the organisation. Full consideration will be given to any proposal made by the Young Farmers Clubs for further provision of grant aid in 2016-17. Assessment will be dependent on achievement of targets as specified within the current agreed programme of delivery and will also be subject to budget availability, key competing departmental priorities and business case approval. Begs for supplement. <coughs> Thank you, Minister, for her response. The Department of Agriculture are keen to ensure good farming practice and improve profitability, and the Department of Health are keen to address the issue of rural isolation. Would the Minister acknowledge that the Young Farmers Clubs of Ulster and the limited funds which helps them coordinate the activities of the various uh, groups and Young Farmers Clubs uh, provides good value? in uh, reducing the dangers of rural isolation and uh, allowing young people to experience uh, good farming practice. Yes, as I said, I, mean, I value the work that they do. Um, they're very active on the ground, working with young people right across this island. And as I said, I, I welcome the fact that they recently came along to the Ploughing Championships and um, held some joint events with Macron and Farmer, their counterpart in the 26 counties. It's very positive work. The numbers of people that they engage with, you know, it speaks for itself in terms of the value that they bring to rural communities. I've worked very closely with them, attended many of their events, and, and, I, and I think that uh, they do play a valuable role. And when it comes to looking towards the future, I'm quite sure that we'll be able to find a way where we can work together around um, valuing what they do and making sure that they deliver and help the department to deliver on our key strategic objectives. Mr. Conor Murphy is not in his place. I call Mr. Phil Flanagan. The, I am pleased to confirm that since the 28th of September 2015, the headquarters of Forest Service has been relocated to Inishkeen House in Inniskillen. Along with the relocation of my fisheries division to Downpatrick in June, the relocation of Forest Service represents the second significant milestone in the programme to relocate my departmental headquarters to four different rural locations across the north. Mr. Flanagan for supplementary. I thank the Minister for her update, and it is indeed welcome news to, to see the further decentralisation of jobs within the, the public sector to rural areas like Fermanna. Uh, but can the Minister uh, give us an indication to what the advantages of uh, Forest Service being located in Enniskillen uh, would be? I think um, the move itself aims to bring um, well, obviously more public sector employment to, to the county, and it will also allow for particularly for Forest Service and the role that they played for closer on the ground experience of what is happening in the timber processing and recreation in the forests in the West. So I think for that um, practical um, work, and I think it, it's, for, it's very beneficial. But the overall benefits of, of relocation, and that's whether it be the Forest Service to Fermanagh or all the other relocations that I am taking forward, um, it's, it's about um, recognising and delivering on one of the recommendations in the independent review of policy on location of public sector jobs. It's about stimulating the local economy through increased um, local spending, provision of high quality and high value public sector jobs, and potentially jobs associated with the construction and the ongoing servicing of a new building. It's about, for me, very much about sharing the wealth acro of, um, across the economy and contributing to better balanced economic growth by commencing to address the disparities in the distribution of public sector jobs right across the north. Well, Mr. Neil Somerville. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, the Minister will be aware that my party has consistently asked for the relocation to Inniskill, and I'm delighted to hear that it has taken place. Um, can the Minister provide an update on how many posts will need to be filled in an external recruitment freeze, and will the people across Vermont be able to apply for these posts? I believe the number of posts that are going to Forest Service are somewhere of, of maybe about 70 posts in total. There's certainly work space for up to 70 um, staff. And whilst um, your party may have asked for it, I certainly delivered it. Well, Mr. Donny Kennedy. Right. <laughs> Question number nine. Under the Cattle Identification Regulations, 2012 keepers must report cattle which are lost or stolen in writing to Dard within seven days of the event being noticed. Information on um, for A, stolen animals, or B, animals reported missing and is um, kept on this department's database and animals and public health information system. 
APHIS does not differentiate between missing or lost or stolen animals. These two categories are recorded collectively on APHIS. The number of cattle reported missing or stolen in the Armagh DVO area in, um, was 389 in 2012-13. 629 in 1314 and 666 in 1415. This totals 1,684 for the three years. The number of cattle reported missing and um, are stolen in the Uri DVO area are um, 406 in 2012-13, 947 in 1314 and 497 in 1415 and that totals 1,850 for the three years. The PSNI actively investigate reports of stolen cattle and I would encourage any keeper who suspects that an animal has been stolen to report it to the PSNI as soon as possible so that a full investigation can be carried out. Kennedy for supplement. Grateful, uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, to the, uh, to the Minister for her answer. Um, given that both uh, the, the Nuri and Armagh uh, respective uh, Dorda offices, veterinary offices, all consistently report the highest number of stolen or missile, missing cattle. Um, the proximity of the border uh, in each office um, is clearly not a coincidence. Um, would the Minister support a national crime agency investigation into these organised crime gangs? I would support any action that helps to remove the criminality that's in our society. I think this is an issue which has um, been raised consistently. I have raised it at the North South Ministerial Council. I think that we do need to see, uh, whilst we have joined up working with um, PSNI and Garda Siakana, I think that there is opportunities for us to work more effectively together in terms of de dealing with any criminality, whether that be in relation to any type of rural crime or, in this um, instance, in relation to cattle theft. Ms. Katrina Ruan. Question number 11, please. On the 9th of September, we received tremendous news that our application to the EU Commission for officially brucellosis-free status had been approved by the Stanton Committee on Plant, Animal, Food and Feed in Brussels. On the 6th of October this year, this decision was formally published in the EU official journal. This means that we are now formally recognised as, as an OBF region. This is excellent news for the industry and is a highly significant milestone in the history of disease eradication here. Achieving, a, achieving formal OBF approval now allows us to introduce further progressive reductions to our control measures, such as an increase to the age at which animals are tested, and further reductions in the frequency of routine surveillance testing. We also hope to make changes to brucellosis pre-export testing for movements of cattle to other member states in the coming weeks. This will greatly reduce the cost these controls place on herd keepers and taxpayers, which in recent years has cost taxpayers some £8 million per year and farmers around £7 million per year in compliance costs. These additional programme reductions will provide further benefits to the industry and will build on the changes that I have already introduced prior to formal publication. In June this year, I extended biannual testing to beef herds. These herds have previously been tested annually. On the 20th of September this year, I abolished pre-movement testing for internal cattle movements. The abolition of pre-movement testing alone is likely to save the farming industry some £2 million a year. Achieving this status is a remarkable achievement considering that the grip that brucellosis had on the farming industry just a few years ago. So I'm acutely aware of how devastating the disease can be, and I congratulate all those who have worked so hard to eradicate it finally. Grand for supplement. I'd like to thank the Minister for that answer, and I wonder, could she outline how will brucellosis testing measures uh, be completed from now on? Yes, as, as a result, we can now begin to roll out um, further programme changes. These will all come into operation over the coming weeks. On Monday, the 19th of October, I will increase the age at which animals are subject to a routine test from 12 to 24 months. On the 2nd of November this year, the frequency with which dairy herds are tested will decrease to some 20% a year over the next five years. We have already introduced biennial testing for beef herds, and this will continue for the next two years. Over the subsequent three years, testing will reduce again to approximately 33% a year. It is appropriate to carry out less frequent blood testing on dairy herds compared to the beef herds because regular milk, bulk milk testing provides an additional assurance about the disease status of these animals. Brucellosis pre-export testing to the south, to Britain and to other member states should also end within the near future. Mr Dominic Bradley. Um, I welcome the news that the Minister has given us today that uh, we are now a uh, brucellosis free uh, zone or have that status. The Minister will remember a number of years ago that there were incidents of brucellosis being spread deliberately. Can I ask the Minister um, what action needs to be taken to ensure that we maintain the brucellosis-free status 
into the future. I think that whilst we relax some of the controls, and the, as I said, there's significant benefit not only in financial terms um, to the farming industry, but just the benefits of um, all the, the, the going through tests. But I think that um, if, we, if we maintain that level of, of um, vigilance, if farmers are aware and report any incidents or any issues that they're concerned with, then I think that we can hold on to our, our status because our status gets us into new markets. It really helps us in terms of marketing um, our produce. So it's tremendous benefits for, for the industry, but I think we always need to be vigilant and we always need to point out where, if, if there are any areas of concerns. And any, any issues of um, people being involved in criminality in terms of deliberately infecting animals with brucellosis or any other disease needs to be condemned and needs to be fully investigated by the authorities. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Mrs Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I wonder could the Minister provide us with an update on uh, the success or otherwise of any cross-border initiatives, particularly in the, the agri-food sector? Yes, and we have regular discussions at NSMC level with uh, Minister Coveney, particularly around new markets. And one of the areas that we've been able to firm up as an ongoing area of discussion is actually trade opportunities. So I think that we need to work together. We're both, um, in terms of jurisdictions, we're both targeting new markets, and I think there are opportunities for us to work together in relation to that and we have very much firmed that up on the NSMC. Alongside of that, we've had a number of very significant interreg programmes that have been taken forward, very successful um, European intervention in terms of community projects and projects that have actually created employment um, right across the island. So a significant body of work there also. There's opportunities under our rural development programme to also bring forward um, new initiatives, and I'm currently working up some initiatives, and I'd be very keen to explore the whole area of rural childcare and if there's something that we can do right across the island in relation to that. So there's quite a, a, a large body of work that's actually ongoing in terms of north-south work. Ms Kelly for a supplement. Uh, thank the Minister for her answer. Could the Minister indicate whether or not she has any uh, budget lines for some of this work? Yes, I mean, obviously the work that we do around um, looking for new trade opportunities and working for market opportunities is all things that we can discuss at ministerial level. But alongside that, yes, I have set aside um, four million pounds under the new rural development programme to look at some sort of cross-border initiatives and that's where I'm sort of thinking and aiming towards perhaps being able to bring forward some interventions that will um, go alongside the, the child care strategy of the executive. Ms Rosaline McCorley. Can I ask the Minister, um, can she outline the arrangements for uh, the inaugural meeting of, of the Supply Chain Forum? Yes, the Agri-Food Strategy Board um, recognised in the Going for Growth um, document the importance of working together both within the industry itself and then between industry and government and that is why I have tasked the industry with taking the lead in delivering this event. The first supply chain forum is going to take place this Wednesday at Lockery's um, Food Innovation Centre and that's going to bring together all the key players from across the agri-food sector to discuss the challenges being faced across the supply chain. I understand that over 80 individuals are expected representing um, every element of the supply chain, feed companies, producers and growers, farming representatives, processors and retailers as well as representatives from the banking sector. So all recognising the importance of the industry and the need to get the supply chain working properly to ensure that all players share the costs, the risks and the profits of their labour. McCorley for a supplement. Uh, uh, can I ask the Minister what will be the benefits for farmers and primary producers through such an engagement? Yes, well, we're, we're going to hear from some guest speakers who are going to be um, sharing their knowledge of the opportunities that exist for local product and the building blocks for our future growth and their first-hand experience of working together with our supply chain partners. There's going to be an opportunity for those attending to share their thoughts, their experiences and their aspirations. And I hope that we can get a real conversation going about um, that will bring about real improvements to the supply chain moving forward. Wednesday's um, supply chain forum will not resolve all the significant challenges that exist, but I do want it to be the starting point for a longer term engagement along the supply chain. I want those involved to start talking to each other again, to rebuild those relationships that may have fallen by the wayside, and I want those involved in the supply chain to be involved in strengthening it and to bring about the change that will help the industry realise its ambitions. Well, Ms. Sandra Overend. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, according to the latest, I economic report from the Danske Bank, while the Northern Ireland economy is set to grow at a moderate rate, unfortunately the agricultural sector um, is expected to contract by 1.4 per cent in the, in the incoming year. Um, how does the Minister see the agriculture sector change in the forthcoming year? I've always said that we are continually talking and we're reminded of because it's a real challenge for all sectors are struggling at this moment in time. It's very hard to see any kind of future. Um, I think that um, 
whilst the economic predictions, and, and I've also um, read those and, and absorbed those, I think that we do need to look to the, the more medium to longer term. And in the medium to longer term, there's a world population that's growing. There's new market opportunities for us. And I think that if we're proactive and going out and, and getting into those markets, we're going to help protect against some of the volatility that obviously is posed to our, our local farming industry. So we have a strategy, we have a vision. Um, I think that we have to continue to keep that under review, be mindful of um, market changes and, and um, changes in terms of pricing and all the other volatilities that are, that are there. But certainly we have a vision for growth and um, we need to lead forward and make sure we create the opportunities and we assist our farming sectors to be able to take advantage of those opportunities when they do arise in the future. Ms. Overen for a supplement. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the response. Um, does the Minister agree um, that the perception of this Assembly and uh, not delivering and the, the ongoing failures of this Assembly and how that is seen uh, not only in Northern Ireland but across the world, that that will affect um, the, economic, uh, the economy of Northern Ireland and will ultimately uh, mean that people that are in the agriculture sector at the minute could end up in welfare uh, in the coming months? I think we have an obligation um, to work with all the sectors and help them to grow. I think that um, over the last number of months, and you very much the focus has been on the dairy crisis, um, I think that very clearly when, when hundreds of farmers came up to the Steps of Stormont to show that they need this executive to work, that they want us to work for them and assist them, very clearly the dairy crisis again pointed up the fact that DEFRA let local farmers down. So if we didn't have a locally elected uh, minister, then there'd be nobody fighting the corner for our our, uh, our farmers in our industry. So it's very clear to me that why we need the executive to work because we need it to deliver for the people that give us a mandate to be here. It's Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Is the minister, com minister confident that local government can effectively facilitate rural development fund? Yes, I, um, we're working our way through the um, plans at this moment. And uh, the local lags that have been established are actually working up their strategies now, and we hope to have them in the department by the end of the year. But certainly, anybody that can get out ahead of that, I'm very, um, very delighted to receive them earlier, because as soon as we can agree their strategies, um, put a, a, a contract in place, then they can start to spend on the ground. So I have no reason to, to believe that there's uh, any issues there. The lags are um, representative of both local councils, but also um, the community sector involvement. Look down for a supplementary. Uh, thank you for the response. Um, unfortunately, I don't really share the Minister's confidence. I don't think the local government is moving as quickly as possible on this. This money um, should have been on the ground a lot sooner than it has been. And with further monies coming now in January from, um, from Europe and th through her department, I am concerned that we're not spending this money in the way we should, particularly because it is the only show in town. So what is the Minister doing to put further mechanisms in place to ensure that we are going to get this money on the ground sometime soon? Well, if the member um, thinks back to the process that we've actually went through, we presented our, our rural development plan to Europe. They have only actually signed off on our rural development plan over the last um, six to eight weeks. As soon as that is um, signed off on, then we're out on the ground. Actually, this time round, there's been a lot of lessons learned compared to the, the, the current programme, which took maybe a couple of years to get spent. This is going to be, we're going to have spent within six months, perhaps, of actually getting our formal sign-off from Europe. So I'm actually very pleased with the progress that's been made. I do expect to see spend very early in the new year in terms of, particularly in relation to priority six, so it's around village plans, it's around um, helping rural businesses, it's around tourism potential, all those things. But we have a really good opportunity to join things up because councils in their new structure are developing their community plans and alongside that they have to develop their rural development program so it's a really good opportunity for those things to marry up and for them to dovetail so we get the maximum benefit so that what councils are doing uh, and what the rural development is doing can complement each other so i do think that um, we're in a very much improved situation than we were in the current program and obviously i am very keen that we start to spend that money as quickly as possible and to the best effect for rural communities mr danny kennedy I ask the Minister to detail uh, what this year's percentage target uh, uh, for issuing basic payments in December is. Well, I think the percentage target is perhaps 93 per cent. Uh, I'll confirm that with the member, but suffice to say that I intend to try and make maximum payments in the first week in December. Kennedy for supplementary. I'm grateful to the member for her uh, uh, response, and I hope that the Department will be able to handle the issue, uh, the issuing of this year's uh, payments in a swift and timely manner. What um, action is she taking to ensure that the provision of top-offs, which many local farmers will be receiving, will not delay the overall payment schedule for the basic payments? Well, I have um, 
The member will, will know that I have year-on-year -year made improvements in terms of the target rates and actually achieving that spend. This year we don't expect to be any different, and that's despite all the challenges that we've had, particularly in terms of bedding in the new common agricultural policy. But what I've prioritised this area of work, and it's about working through all those issues which have been very difficult and complicated, not just for the department but also for farmers individually in terms of understanding the new CAP and what it means for them and their farm business. But we're working our way steadily through all those things. We're trying to my job in terms of my priority is to make sure that we maximise those number of payments and that we um, continue that good record of delivery in the last number of years. Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for a further update on progress on the review of the Welfare of Animals Act? The member will be aware that we published the interim um, report um, some time ago and we're working our way through that. We've actually had some progress in that the um, Minister for Justice has actually agreed uh, one of the draft um, recommendations which was around the maximum sentencing, so I think that's very positive. So whilst we're working our way towards the, the, the end game, we have actually brought forward some changes that are going to be very positive. A little first supplementary. Thank the Minister and welcome that update with regards to progress on an increase in the maximum sentences for animal cruelty offences. The interim report also recommended a single animal welfare website and a public information campaign to ensure that the public know who best to contact when concerned about animal welfare issues. Are there any updates in relation to those recommendations? We're working our way through all of them. I don't have the exact details, but I'm very happy to provide that to the member in writing. But suffice to say, we are working our way through all the recommendations. And um, I think that the interim report pointed out a number of very practical things that we could probably do very quickly, and that, that certainly is one of them. Mr. Roy Begg. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, we are recently experiencing a, a very mild autumn period and a very dry one, but as we approach the winter period, we can expect to have intense periods of rainfall and the associated increased risk of flooding. How confident is the Minister that no home or business will be flooded? as a result of defective uh, infrastructure? Well, I don't think um, I could give any Karstern guarantees because I can't control the weather, but um, we have taken forward quite a number of um, significant investment projects in terms of trying to deal with flood alleviation. I mentioned some of them in my earlier answers. Um, and we have a full programme again this year alongside the work that we're doing around trying to help individuals protect their own um, projects around the individual flood protection plan. So there's quite a large area of work. We're working very closely with all the responders around um, how we collectively work together because cross-departmental working is key in terms of dealing with flood because it may be flooding from, um, from rainfall, it may be flooding because of rivers, it may be flooding because a whole combination of reasons. So it's important that we have that cross-departmental working. Mr Beggs for supplementary. The Minister has mentioned uh, large um, capital projects and, and flood alleviation schemes and rightly so that, that should occur. But can the Minister assure me that all necessary maintenance is being carried out on gratings, culverts, open waterways to ensure that there will be no flooding from uh, lack of maintenance because maintenance is also essential to reduce the risk of flooding affecting homes and businesses? Yeah, Rivers Agency, um, in terms of their remit, um, are, go out, they take a look at um, any particular problems, they clear, clear grills, they do all the practical work on the ground, they prioritise work based on their assessment of flood risks, and um, it, it's a very important piece of work that they do, and that's part of their ongoing day-to-day -day work, so there's no, no reason to doubt that they're not doing what they should be doing, and perhaps if there was um, a DRD minister in place, they would also be doing their role in terms of inspecting the gullies and drains that they're responsible for. Well, Mr Adrian Cochrane Watson. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for her assessment of the importance of the local Catholic colleges to the local agricultural industry, and in particular the courses delivered by the Green Mount campus in my own constituency? CAFRI are um, a great organisation that provides um, first class education, both um, to young students coming forward, anybody who's got an interest in food and farming. Um, and I, I think the fact that we were oversubscribed every year shows that there is a demand for what they provide on the ground. Also alongside that, they do very practical work with farmers around um, benchmarking, around um, working with farmers around practical things, um, good housekeeping, good husbandry, all, all those things. So um, I, I'm very pleased with the work that CAFRI do and I think that we can be very proud of the work that CAFRI do at all our um, three uh, locations, our campuses, both in Enniskillen, in Lockery and also in Greenmount. Sir Cochrane Watson for a supplementary. Can I welcome the Minister's please for Greenmount? Uh, and on the other campuses. Unfortunately, however, the experience of the last 12 months shows the Minister is not following up her support with actions. For instance, a reduction to veterinary nursing 
course earlier this year was disappointing, and can the Minister give a commitment that she will try to avoid such instances of courses being reduced in the future? Yes, I mean, CAFRI take the operational decisions and they look towards what courses they can provide, what there's a demand for, and they have t taken um, some hard decisions. And you have to remember why they're having to take hard decisions is because the Tory government keeps cutting our block grant. So that causes difficulties for all of us in terms of our departments and what we're delivering. You can shake your head and laugh all you want, but it's a, it certainly is a reality. Um, in terms of, um, as I said, CAFRI, they do excellent work. They are providing courses for um, thousands of students, and, I, and we very much value the work that they do. They have unfortunately had to prioritise, but the reason they've had to prioritise is not to be forgotten, it's because the Tory government keep cutting the block grant. Time is up. Members will wish to take their ease while we change the top table.